So good morning, everybody. I want to thank those that are here in attendance at our program in Louisville, Kentucky. Let me just thank those that have been sponsoring this Compass MS Care series all year. So we have EMD Serono, Sandoz, Biogen, Genentech, Banner Life Sciences, Novartis, Bristol Myers Squibb, and Santa Fe. And I would like all of you all to say thank you by giving them a round of applause. Come on, let's hear everybody. Okay, great, thank you. Our presenter is Dr. Samuel F. Hunter from Franklin, Tennessee. Dr. Hunter is a, he's the medical director of Advanced Neuroscience Institute in Franklin. Like I said, he's been a very well-known speaker for us for many years. I will continue to use him all around the country as much as we can, or as his time per permits. And so I'm gonna let him speak with you about, you have agendas on the table and everybody that's online, it's part of what you saw in the image you know, with, uh, with this program. So you'll see what he's gonna be speaking about and, uh, and you'll watch the program, okay? Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you, Stuart. It's a pleasure always to work with MS uh, Views and News. It is an amazing company in terms of getting good content for MS patients out there. Um, there's never been anything like it in terms of the variety and the, and the practicality for people with MS. I've been doing medicine for over 40 years now, and uh, I'm a float all the boats kind of person. I'm not in competition with anybody. Um, you know, I try very hard to get my patients uh, what they need every day, and I work 24-7. Um, that said, insurance companies uh, work against us sometimes uh, if we can get them to do what we want. So I'm going to help you understand how to make decisions with your doctor and how to view your MS therapy. Uh, I'm not gonna talk a lot about treating symptoms. That's a big topic of its own. And you have uh, seen that there are a lot of companies out there who want your attention about their MS therapies. All these therapies have advantages and disadvantages. Uh, it's gotten more complicated because there are generic therapies out there and understanding what the role of those in your care is also important and who, who you go to for help. There is not a one-stop shop in most cases for MS and even comprehensive care programs have many specialty areas that are involved and, and depends on the individual with MS, what they need. So um, I have a nonprofit organization that helps fund these, these aspects of, of care. Um, we mostly work with other nonprofits at this time. We will talk about the shared decision making and how you understand newer MS treatments and treat your MS today and how you find a local care team. So what is shared decision making? Well, shared decision making is a concept that goes against the old way doctors used to do things. They walk in, they tell you this is what you should do. They want your input and they want you to agree on a course action. Um, everybody has different approaches to how they want to live their life. And in chronic diseases, it's not a one-time decision. It's an ongoing plan and decision. And people look at what they need in different ways. Some people are more concerned about abilities. Some people are more concerned about medication complications. Um, it is an insult to your life and your personhood when you aren't able to do the things that you want to do. And uh, this is true of many medical diseases, whether it's a bad back, a bad knee, you know, headaches, or MS. Um, they're all things that get in the way of you controlling your life and your lifestyle. The financial aspects of any illness and medical care are substantial and there's no easy way around it. And people oftentimes base their decisions on those concerns as well. So in terms of neurology, I will say there is there are camps, but no neurologist does it the same way as another. And one of the really stark differences in, in specialty care is that there are doctors who do and doctors who don't when it comes to MS. And uh, nowadays you've even got doctors who are only hospital and doctors who are not hospital. But this, this one in 
two sort of aspect of people who don't want to hear the word multiple sclerosis because they don't want to deal with it is across the world a really big problem. Why is that? Because you're complicated. You're not simple to do. Uh, it takes time. No matter if you're doing well, it takes time. And if you're doing badly, it takes time. If you're doing well, you've got lots of questions. If you're doing badly, you're lots of work. So, so doctors learn very quickly early on that it's an investment of their effort. Um, the insurance company system is very brutally against people who have to do a lot of work for you. And, and pretty much anyone who spends their time and effort trying to help you gets punished roundly by insurance companies. So realize that anybody who's trying to help is really your friend. All right. Don't take the, take out the frustrations you have on them because it, it, it isn't uh, worth it. it, it they, are, they are your advocate. Um, you will hear a lot of unpleasant things from neurologists. And some of these things are meant to try to uh, make you less of work and often directed towards stopping therapy, which most likely you've needed recently and had trouble with your MS. Um, the um, long ago, before we had therapy for MS, many of these statements began because they were there to uh, make people feel better about a situation that we couldn't fix. But they've continued because the doctors aren't happy about the situation. And one of these statements was, MS isn't so bad. And this was pioneered by uh, the doctors who actually trained me. And they were excellent doctors uh, for MS at diagnosing it and understanding it. But they would tell this to people because they didn't think that treatment made a big enough difference. And once the data came uh, that treatment makes an enormous difference, they still kept saying it because it, it was a lot easier to do that and, and ignore it than it was to actually treat people. Now, uh, the same statement, many people are benign. Benign MS has a very clear definition. Benign MS means, in retrospect, after 20 years, you really don't have anything that limits you. And how many people with MS is that? It's less than 5%. So it's a safe bet in any venue where they take your money that your MS is not benign. So, um, and then more recently, if you're doing well and you've been treated and you don't have a lot of damage in your nervous system or on your MRI, doctors take to saying, maybe you never had MS. I don't think you have MS anymore because they don't want to deal with your MS. And you have to, to uh, say, look, here, here it was. You really need to have medical records uh, and collect them because even after many years or decades, you'll have doctors do this to you in order to try to avoid treating you. Um, the finally, uh, people who've had MS for a long time get the, your MS is burned out. And that is rarely true. But MS does decline in the severity of the disease activity as decades go by. And uh, you have almost a religion and cult among neurologists where you have these doctors who say people over 50 or over 60 or whatever age they, they make up because there is no data uh, really don't need uh, treatment anymore. And the, 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 the evidence for this is very minimal. It comes from research trials where older patients weren't treated as well. So what was the point of putting them on treatment? Well, the fact is everybody who's older with MS has trouble. Uh, the question is how much? Um, and so this is oftentimes said to patients in the face of, well, they have new MRI lesions or a few years ago, they needed steroids and those people don't need to be taken off treatment. And anybody who says that is either not paying attention to you or paying attention to the reality and just trying to simplify your management. So how do you make decisions? Uh, it's trade off between risk and benefit and cost and convenience. 
and those are most of the factors. And uh, risks are what concern people. Um, doctors are comfortable with risk as long as you're getting an appropriate benefit, generally. Uh, some centers will use very risky medicines, uh, even sometimes for profit and convenience. It's easier just to slap people on it. In some parts of the world, you only have one treatment option. If you're in Sweden, everybody gets an old uh, medicine called rituximab because they make it there, it's cheap, and it's easier just to throw everybody in one clinic and give them the same thing. Uh, some individuals who treat MS use only old, very safe medicines because they don't want to have to worry about risk. Well, many of those medicines, and in general, the medicines that are safest also have the least risk, and vice versa. The most risk have also some of the most benefits. Um, so n most neurologists actually in practice, if they're not running an MS program, really only use a few medicines. And so they, th that's for two reasons. One is they're familiar with them, and one is they, it's a huge overhead to learn how to use a medicine. And so it's very possible when you ask somebody about this medicine or that medicine, you'll get an answer which is partially because I don't know, you know, but you'll get some kind of answer from them. Now, um, if you are one of the people who's so risk averse that you don't want to take a medicine that's adequate to control your MS, well, you'll have problems that you don't, uh, you don't need to have. And some people are so afraid of MS problems to take a medicine that has really substantial risks more than they need, like going and getting stem cell chemotherapy or getting uh, natalizumab, which is known as Tysabri. It's about to have a copycat version of it. Uh, when, when that's not necessary to control their illness. The, um, some of our safest medicines have a long list of possible side effects or have annoying side effects that you have to deal with and see if you can tolerate. And uh, that is just because something causes side effects doesn't mean it's dangerous. And some medicines have very many side effects, but they really are pretty rare that many of the things that are concerning happen. So I ask people, you know, when they are talking about drugs that are chemotherapy based or like Tysabri, are you okay with a two to 5% risk of a uh, life threatening or risk of death situation? And most people say no. Uh, but why is so-and-so getting that medicine? Why well, that's between so-and-so and their doctor. <laughs> you know, I can't tell you that. But the same question would go about hospitals. I mean, if your treatment has a risk in that range of getting hospitalized because of a complication, are you okay with that? And, um, you know, this comes up and we'll talk a little bit about some of the rare complications here. Um, but if you had a one in 5,000 risk of, of death from a medication that was effective and controlled your EMS, is that satisfactory? Well, the odds you're going to get killed driving to the doctor is probably more than one in 5,000. And that's where we are with most of our MS medicines. All right. So you want to agree on a course of action with who's treating you. And uh, you need to understand what's happened in the past, because a lot of times that's part of why you're looking at treatment and what you want in the future. For the most part, the risk of of our medicines is very limited and, and we understand with, with a few exceptions and your doctor usually makes those clear to you. Um, as far as the benefits, the benefit is almost entirely what never happens. And so that is a very difficult thing for an individual to perceive. You can't perceive that when we're treating you for high blood pressure. You can't perceive that when we're treating you for cholesterol. You can't perceive that when we treat you for diabetes. And you can't perceive that many times for MS. That said, some people get some very favorable perceptions because of how they feel with their MS therapies. And that's good. But those are not most of the benefits. The biggest benefit is what never happens to you. Never new disabilities, not as many relapses. And many people with very severe MS are still gonna get worse with their MS. As you get older, that damage that you've had your entire life in your nervous system 
it becomes a bigger and bigger toll on the nervous system and makes it work not as well. So you always need to look at risks and benefits. Um, you need to realize that even medications that have a long, long list of risks aren't necessarily things you have to worry about. And uh, they may have little practical side effects in practice, and the long-term benefits may be tremendous. So um, finally, what I'd say is doctor's advice is cheap. Sometimes it's worthless, but it's cheap relative to disability. And so uh, neurologists long time ago coined the term, what is lost is not regained, because it is very, very true in MS, among other diseases. So I wanted to talk about a few examples of how you share this decision making. And uh, it's, it's a back and forth, and it's always good that people understand what their issues are. There are some people who say, please just tell me what to do. And there are other people who really want a good explanation. Sometimes this explanation is an hours long kind of uh, session that, that you have to make sure everybody's on the same page. But this is an example of somebody who has a strong penchant for natural treatment for their MS, whatever that means. It usually means diet or exercise or uh, supplements of some kind. And, and somebody with typical MS who already has a significant impairment and uh, she, she had uh, difficulty with medication. She read a book that talks about curing your MS with diet, which does not happen. It certainly can help you. Um, and, and, but this confidence that lifestyle will protect you against MS, um, it's usually misplaced. And it does help you, um, but y you don't know until it's too late that it didn't work, and it usually doesn't. Um, so, so, you know, th there's a lot of stories and people hear these things and they believe things they hear online or in a lecture and, and they, they don't understand what's missing. And then, you know, where a doctor says, well, my diet saved me and she got chemotherapy to special lease center for a year before, uh, that's kind of not the whole story and diets are good. Diets are great, but if you can't find an agreement with your doctor about him move forward, then treatment doesn't happen. Well, you know, things often don't go well. And so that's often the case, and all neurologists see this happen, is people come back and they're really in a bad way. They've had a lot of problems and they're desperate because they have some major limitations. And the window uh, for really effective treatment early on is passed and you're dealing with problems in the nervous system which not only don't get better but often are going to get worse and now you want stronger medicines but the people who pay for these medicines have established rules for what you have to try first so you're looking at years of less effective medicines in many cases in order to get more effective medicines uh, if, if at all and so this is a frustrating situation. This is kind of how shared decision making go wrong. All right. Now, what about when there are, are legitimate options for treating things differently? And people get very frustrated with, with their journey and trying different medications for MS. They may have trouble uh, with the medication, they may have trouble with the insurers, they may have trouble with the pharmacies, they may have trouble with copays, um, and uh, they just get fed up. And uh, there is uh, a, a treatment uh, that has been used rarely for MS that's generally referred to as stem cells. It is not stem cells, it is chemotherapy. The stem cells are used to save your life because it's basically otherwise a fatal dose of chemotherapy. And does this work for MS? Um, it, for certain situations with MS, yes, it does work. But you know, a, a substantial people, people pass away from complications um, of the treatment. And it has some bad effects on the brain as well. Now, there are people around the world who offer this treatment at cut rates, and how do they do that? They reduce the dose, they don't have to put you in the hospital, and about the time your hair comes back, often your MS does too, and then you're, you're be uh, better off not ever having done it. And there are a lot of medicines that work really well now, and this is a 30-year-old idea of how we should treat MS, and it's still being researched because it still has the same problems. So, but 
that is something that you know a few in a thousand people with MS might might get and go to a center. But if you go to the appropriate center in the United States and they do it right, it will work a lot better than if you go to an Eastern European or South American facility that does it wrong. That's a discussion you need to have with the physician. Now. Um, what about complications of MS? Well, one of the horrible things that can go wrong with MS treatment, and very rarely with most MS treatments, but not so rarely with one of the important ones that's used for rescue disease, is, a, is an infection called PML, which is, stands for progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. And just to make it complicated, it's caused by a virus called JC virus, which has nothing to do with mad cow disease, like it sounds. But this virus, everybody has. Even if they think they don't have it or somebody tells them their test is negative, they probably still have it. But it is only a problem when people have a, a limitation in their immune system that's present for a long time and they're very unlucky because that virus mutates into a brain-eating virus. And it isn't a brain-eating virus you caught from somebody and it's not a brain-eating virus you have normally. But it does happen. And natalizumab or Tysabri, as it's been called for decades, is a drug that has over a 1% risk for most people in the long term of this happening. And so it is a, um, it is a devastating complication. Usually it doesn't go well. Um, uh, death, disability, uh, permanent impairments uh, really drives your MS bananas too. But um, the, uh, there are plenty of other options to using this medication. This is kind of a last choice medicine um, and even when people don't have a strong reaction to the virus, their risk is not I insignificant because it will usually appear over time. And, and the first sym symptom you may have that you have it may be misinterpreted as part of your MS and often is, and that's just normal. So uh, most of our MS medicines today have this listed as a potential side effect. Why is it listed? Because it happened to somebody sometime who was on that medicine, many of whom actually got the drug that really causes the problem before, or rarely it just happens. And uh, normally it's about one in 80,000 chance of getting this problem to the average older person. But is that, is that a risk? Well, they usually have cancer or HIV or chemotherapy. Uh, cancer is the most common by far. Um, but when you have just MS, it's maybe one in five to 10,000 with most of our medicines. Uh, some of the older medicines don't have any risk at all. Some of the, some of the risks are so low that it's, it's questionable whether it's even related. But if you're coming off Tysabri, one in a thousand people will get it in the next six months, even though they're coming off the Tysabri. So uh, helping people understand these risks, because if somebody comes in the door and says, I'm absolutely not gonna take something that causes PML, um, well, you're, you're throwing away your chance at a, at a much more normal and happy life. Um, because if you need something that might do that, your doctor isn't going to give that to you. So understanding what you're dealing with in risks and benefits is really important. All right. Well, let's talk about how we're changing in how we manage MS. Uh, we had for a long time, for about 10, 10 to 15 years, drugs which were um, really quite safe, but of limited uh, benefit in controlling disease. And these we generally call the ABCR drugs. And uh, for the brand names, the drugs, they were Abinex, Beta Serine, Copaxone, Rebiv, and there are more. There's a drug called Plegardy. Um, and these are very safe drugs. And uh, the, the drug that uh, is in the same efficacy class would be called Abagio nowadays, that's just gone generic. Um, it's about the same effectiveness and, and, and a very safe drug. And then we have drugs that are stronger and these drugs are in several classes. We'll talk about these classes. They're called dimethyl, the fumarates, uh, the S1P modulators, and the anti-CD20s. And these drugs are stronger than the older drugs. And they are pretty safe. They're not as safe, but they're pretty safe. Um, and so we're looking at most people trying to start there. 
nowadays. And why is that? because most people will fail for efficacy on the other therapies. And if you've been on one of these older therapies for 15 years and you haven't had a relapse and your MRI's done really good and you're not getting worse in your disability, well, those are fine. You know, and sometimes we go to those because there is a safety problem and people seem to be easy to treat and it's fine to do that. But the odds are if you're a younger person, new in MS or a failed drug, you need stronger medicine. There's no point in sticking around with drugs in a class that while they're safe, really don't control the disease generally. We, don't, we have more choices. There are drugs that are coming and the emerging ideas, there's a lot of companies testing drugs we call BTKIs. Uh, they're not after the serial killer who was buying torture and kill. He, this is, has nothing to do with that. This is they, what these signaling systems do, and you, you see medicines like this advertised for many diseases on TV, especially psoriasis and rheumatoid arthritis. They're called kinase inhibitors. They block the signaling system inside that activates immune cells. And uh, every one of these drugs is um, a very interesting drug in its own right. And these are being developed and with the hope that they're more effective and better tolerated and safer than uh, existing therapies. And because if, a, if you build a better mousetrap, you can sell it in, in the medical world. And they're about three to five years away. They basically, uh, work as well as being on steroids out the time without any of the steroid issues. You know. um, as far as newer treatments to repair the brain, which we call remyelination, they have not proven themselves yet in testing. There's been several uh, failures that have been disappointing for drugs that work very well in animals but have not had obvious benefits. Why don't they have obvious benefits? Uh, when they work because people repair things already and most people who are below the age of 50 actually have substantial repair in their nervous system of MS lesions. This is the most important argument for controlling your MS because if you control it, it can improve and a lot of people will improve. Um, some of the newer things that are in, uh, that are in testing are, are variations on thyroid hormone and uh, tiny gold particles that are anti-inflammatory. And whether those work, we'll have to see. There are new cellular therapies that are engineered stem cells that make uh, trophic signals, which are, which are hormonal signals that make the brain rebuild. And there are engineered T cells, which go after Epstein-Barr virus. These are still highly experimental in very early stages. But when you see people who have really severe MS, who've gotten some of these treatments, and they actually improve, that's the new holy grail. And that's what we're looking at. Those things are 10 years away from being available if they work. And then there's still efforts to reprogram the immune system. The immune system is, is, is basically got the address of your brain and it doesn't want to leave it alone. Well, there are experimental ways to stop that that aren't very toxic, that are like allergy shots. And, uh, Although one of our old MS medicines is a lot like an allergy shot too. The glutamic acetate or copaxone is like an allergy shot. But these are much more powerful ways that work in experimental models. So that's kind of what's there for MS now. What's coming down the road is a lot like what we already have uh, in the next few years. A lot of Me Too drugs. What's really the game changer right now is the fact that we have generic drugs coming to market for MS. And we're in, we've experienced what's a free falling cost for one of the generic drugs in the last year called dimethylfumarate, which was sold as brand name Tecfidera. There's nothing wrong with brand name Tecfidera. It's just, you can now get these drugs very cheap from some pharmacies. And it's like watching the stock market. It's up and down. And we've got a situation where certain pharmacies are poised to profiteer on the cost of very cheap medication with you because you're used to getting your drug from them. And affiliated pharmacies a lot of times will do that because they don't want to dispense it because they have a partner pharmacy that can charge you many times as much. So if you've gone online ever to GoodRx and looked at discounts, you can look up dimethylfumarate. 
uh, it's $56 advertised. Uh, pharmacies won't always honor those prices nowadays, even though they advertise them. And it may be $2,000 at another pharmacy, even Walmart. Uh, Dalfamperdine, which a lot of people use to treat their walking and MS, um, is, is 50 bucks at many pharmacies, and it's hundreds more at others. Um, if you go to Mark Cuban's pharmacy, which is an online uh, email only, sign up for it, and your doctor has to send your email address to get, you in, get your prescription there, um, then you can get some outstanding discounts on these drugs. Unbelievable discounts. Now, they're not going to file your insurance. Let me tell you, that discount's lower than anybody's copay for anything generally, unless they have really spectacular benefits at a specialty pharmacy. But the fact that these things cost so much difference is, is part of the sign of what's wrong with the healthcare system in that um, it's, it's driven a lot by these kind of contracts and, and things rather than the real cost. It's, but you can save a lot of money if you do these things. Now, if you can't take these medicines, these benefits don't help you. And most of the other medicines are brand name and you have to, to work around that. Biological medicines, like injectable medicines or IV medicines, will never be cheap because they're very, very expensive to manufacture, not only to get approved, but to manufacture. And uh, the, the requirements that are needed to manufacture these drugs and market these drugs are so much more expensive than what the chemical entities are, which are you know things that come in pills and capsules, is dramatic. So what's good about generic medicines? They're cheap. What's bad about them? You don't get manufacturer assistance, so they gotta be really cheap before you don't need that to afford them. Because when a medicine first goes generic, the, the first competitor costs about the same. And the insurance company may make you take it, and they don't give you any manufacturer assistance. They make a lot of money the first few months making people pay for it, um, pay that, huge 10 or 20 percent copay whatever their insurance company makes you pay without the assistance but after six months more copies come in are allowed to come in and by a couple of years you're talking 50 to 100 dollars a month for medicines that's what happened with dalfamperdine that's happened with dimethylfumarate it will happen with other drugs sabagio and um Jelenia just went generic um so we are looking at these medicines also for going to effective oral options from what we call a de-escalation. Say you've done really well for a few years on Tysabri or on, on uh, uh, Ocrevus uh, or Limtrata, but you clearly need more treatment for your MS. We look at these options. You're in a different situation now. Just because it didn't work well good enough in the past doesn't mean it won't work well in the future. So how do we do it? We usually skip the older drugs, the three classes, the interferon beta, the glutaramer acetate, and obagio, although they are fine for tolerability or safety purposes if you haven't been controlled on it or you're not likely to be controlled on it as a first drug. You need to take the other three classes, the methyl fumarates, Tecfidera, which is called, now called dimethyl fumarate generically, Vumeridae, which is a different drug called deroximal fumarate, or Bifirtam, monomethyl fumarate. We'll talk about that class. And then there's S1Ps, there's Gelinia, Mazin, Zaposia, and Ponvori. And all these drugs have distinct advantages and disadvantages, and uh, they're still fairly expensive. And then there's an anti-CD20 that's injectable called Cosemptor. And then there's four basic classes of much more powerful medicines. The ones we call the heavy lifters. There's Tysabri, uh, which is, uh, and there's another drug that's going to be just like Tysabri this coming. There's uh, anti-CD52, which is Lemtrata, which is kind of the granddaddy of old medicines, uh, but it's very hard to use and most doctors can't handle it in many patients uh it's it's too involved for them and then there's anti-cd20s which right now the old one is rituxan it's not approved for ms but it's still used for that by some people and there's ocrevus which is very widely used and probably the most successful drug ever in ms and then there's a drug coming called ublituximab i don't know what the brand name is going to be from tg uh pharma if it gets approved this month um, and these, these are drugs that have uh, a, 
a good tolerability profile with excellent benefit in therapy, but are generally used for many years on end. And then there's other kinds of older chemotherapy. There was a drug called cyclophosphamide that widely used 20 or 30 years ago. Mitoxantrone we used about 20 years ago. The problem with these drugs is they're not very safe. They have big risks of life-threatening complications. And there's other high-dose regimens that are used as part of these so-called stem cell or autologous hematologic stem cell transplants. Um, the, these are drugs. And then if you b break it down, this is, this is what treatment for MS looks like. All right, so let's talk about the methyl fumarates. Great, great treatment idea. Completely came about by serendipity. A rather eccentric pharmacist 40 years ago in Germany thought psoriasis must be caused by a dietary deficiency of fumaric acid. Nobody knows why he thought this. There was no data for it. But he made up some drugs, and he first put them on people's skin. They didn't work very well. And then he gave them to people by mouth. You could do this in Germany 40 years ago. And um, they worked well for psoriasis. And some of the people with psoriasis had MS, and they said, my MS is really better. And a United States company uh, bought that company and uh, tested that drug for MS, and it became Tecpedera. And uh, when we first saw the data for it, we said, Wow, it works really quite well, and it's really simple, and it's pretty safe. Uh, the, the biggest problem was stomach side effects. But now that it's gone generic, you can be in the situation that the generic one can have a substantial copay because the cost is whatever the pharmacy wants to say the cost is. Mark Cuban says it's $55. You don't need to worry about any copay assistance with that. But uh, Walmart will say it's $2,000. You know, so you've got to deal with that. And the advantage is it's hard to beat the cash prices some of the places, and uh, the disadvantage is that this drug is harder on the stomach than the other ones in the class. And if you've ever had a bellyache from Tecfidera, you know what I mean. But 75% of people can take it. They get a little bellyache for a couple of weeks, and then they go on. Why is that? It's very irritating to the stomach. Now, there are two other drugs in this class. And if you look at the pictures up on the right, there is a stomach. And, and really, the drug goes into your stomach, and the drug that goes into your blood are two different things. It breaks into pieces. It's kind of like a, a, a spacecraft that has a part that launches it in. and a part that takes off. Well, um, the Vumeridae or deroximal fumarate has a different launch vehicle to get it in, and it doesn't irritate the stomach as much. And then the other drug, which is uh, Banner's drug called Bifirtam, is actually the active drug. It's called monomethyl fumarate. And originally, this didn't get developed because the company who had the drugs uh, thought they couldn't put it into a pill because it's a, it's a sticky molecule. And uh, this company, whose specialty is dealing with hard to formulate drugs, did it. And they have their drug on the market. Looks like a standard capsule down there. And you have a little dog juggling in the corner, a bunch of different balls. Why is that? Because this drug has several tricks. It works several different ways. It, it, first of all, it trips the sensor inside the cell that makes it think it's under oxygen stress. And that turns on a very powerful pathway for blocking injury to cells called the antioxidant uh, enzymes. It also indirectly turns off the strong inflammatory pathways, which is probably why it works in part for MS. But the other things it does is it mimics some signals in your body that are used by metabolism to calm down the immune system. This is what causes the flushing with this class of drugs. It, it is a widespread anti-inflammatory effect, and it's the same effect people get from fasting. Um, the, uh, the final thing it does that, that Johns Hopkins uh, doctors have said is that it knocks off the bad lymphocytes. It impairs their energy metabolism. And uh, this is probably part of how it works, too, because we know that people's lymphocytes go down about 30%, and it's the nasty cells that go down. It's the ones that do the damage. So this is a cool drug, if you can take it. The other class that's been very popular for a long time are called S1P modulators. They were developed from a Chinese herbal medicine that's up in the upper right corner. It's a little ball of fungus. It's actually a cicada in a little ball of fungus, a cicada larvae, technically, not the ones you usually see 
out flying around and making noise. Um, and this is Chinese herbal medicine that was researched back in the 80s and 90s. And it was they found the chemical that was responsible for this change in the immune system that the, this fungus used to invade uh, these insects. And it was very recognizable what it was related to. It's related to a, a molecule that we didn't even understand at that time was important to inflammation. But it's very important to MS inflammation. And it's a signaling molecule called sphingosine 1-phosphate. It's a lipid that, that is transformed into a signaling system. And it's a very, very ancient uh, signaling system. It's in insects. It's in people. It's in all animals. And uh, it can be used uh, to direct immune cells at, to uh, go to a location, leave a lymph node, go to a location, and initiate an attack. And what these family of drugs do is they interfere with this signaling process by basically stimulating the signaling system so much it shuts down. And down in the lower right corner is a picture of all the cells inside the brain it affects for favorable ways, and it also stops the direction of the cells to get back in the bloodstream and go hunt for their target. And this actually doesn't slow the immune system down that much. It just slows down the cells that are really activated. And so these have some infrequent problems with uh, blood pressure or heart rate and uh, the eye, eye uh, inflammation sometimes or skin cancers. And uh, so these risks in practice are a tiny fraction of the people who take them and they're very well tolerated medicines. But many people w will feel better who take this family of medicines in the, in the general sense. They report better mood, better thinking, less fatigue, uh, you know, the, 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 this is a very common effect of these medicines, and all the company that makes these have data that says this happens, but they're not allowed to tell you about it because government won't let them tell you. So the older oral drug that is is uh, basically a Baggio or leflunamide. Leflunamide's approved for rheumatoid arthritis, but some doctors use it for MS because it becomes the same drug that we have approved for MS. It's it's uh, a brand name drug that is in the process of going generic. In a couple of years, it will be very expensive. This is an ideal drug often for older people with MS or people with milder MS because it's very well tolerated. And it's uh, we're not allowed to talk about if I'm doing a program for a drug company, I'm not allowed to say it's probably an antiviral drug, but we think it's an antiviral drug. Um, it, it's, it's great for most people that have too sensitive stomachs to take methyl fumarates. Um, it comes on very slowly and it leaves very slowly. It has pregnancy liabilities, so you really have to exercise stream care if somebody can conceive a child to make sure they don't get pregnant. And that's true of the S1Ps too. All right, so what about this drug you see advertised on TV all the time, Casempta? Uh, it's called Ofatumumab. It's an injectable version uh, of the same type of medicine that's an Ocrevus, but it's a much lower dose. It doesn't deplete the immune cells that it's going after as, as dramatically. And it, it really, so far, the side effect profile looks very respectably good, other than some occasional first dose reactions and uh, the low side effects and complications, it actually didn't knock the immune system down as much as Abagio did, which w stunned everybody. We, we had no idea that that was possible in the class. And so um, the, the, uh, whether, um, whether there's something long-term that's a downside, we don't know yet. The drug's only been around a few years. What about the heavy lifters I talked about earlier? Ocrevus, anti-CD20. Let me tell you, never have insurance companies hated an MS therapy more. Tysabri comes close because these are expensive. There is this game with pharmacy medicines called uh, rebates, which are legal kickbacks that happen with money under the table. So the insurance company will tell you, or the pharmacy will tell you, your medicine cost $80,000. Actually, most of them cost ninety or hundred now, and uh, your copay is is twenty thousand dollars or ten thousand uh, dollars a year. You know, and uh, you break that down in a month, and you get the monthly copays. 
and, or your out of pocket maximum at some point takes over. But what really happens is they're giving 25 or 30 percent of the money back under the table to the insurer, and that's not coming to you. And the it, the manufacturer is often also paying your copay for you. So it's a huge game. And if they don't play it, if the if the manufacturers don't play this game with the insurers and the contractors, they don't let them sell the drug. So this is unfortunately, it would be called graft and if it was happening in any kind of other public setting, but it's a part of how it works. It's just how the thing works. So you just got to understand they hate Ocrevus and Tysabri and Lemtrata because they don't get these kickbacks for those drugs because they come in under a medical benefit. And when it comes in under a medical benefit, they're not making, they, they're addicted to these rebates. They like these rebates. And, you know, about the only reason they let people have brand name drug, which something goes generic is so they can get the rebate, you know, and make you pay the copay or the drug company can't pay the copay. So these three drugs are very important. A small minority of people need Tysabri or Limtrata to control their MS. Much more get Ocrevus because of it's, it's, a, it's a more user-friendly drug for many neurologists. They understand it. It's, it's uh, got uh, a more straightforward safety. Uh, pretty much the only thing bad about any CD20s is a few percent of people have some hospitalizations for serious infections. And your doctor has a way to assess some of your infection risk with blood tests. Um, but it is, they're all very effective drugs for MS. Tysabri, it's kind of an off and on drug. Ocrevus and Lemtrata, they permanently change your immune system to make it less severe. Um, IV chemotherapy, these are those old ways of treating MS I talked about. You know, cyclophosphamide, not used really anymore. Uh, Mitoxantrone, not rarely used in the US, still used across the world because it's very effective for MS and it's very cheap. And, uh, but the 5% risk of leukemia or cancer, uh, leuke leukemia or um, heart failure, it's not something that we'd like to do. But there was one time when we didn't have a good drug for MS and we used it quite a bit. And this stem cell transplant was a very good idea. It's not a good idea for the vast majority. It's a very good idea for somebody with absolutely outlandish MS who's very early in their disease. If you get it done in a really good center, but I've really most of the time never seen a good effect of it done the way it's often done at centers that do it a lot. Uh, the few places that do it rarely are actually pretty good at it. Uh, they do use it a little more in Canada and Europe where basically the public health system sees it as a cost saving measure because they've got hospitals and they've got people working and the drugs are cheap that they use. It's the hospitalization that's expensive. All right, so how do you get care for your MS? This is not easy. It's not easy for any chronic disease. Um, you need a bunch of people. You need a good primary care person. The primary care people that are out there, um, you've got to find somebody who's not scared of MS, uh, who's willing to help with your general medical issues. Um, you need your blood pressure, your blood sugar, your cholesterol all controlled. Because if you don't get them controlled, um, you're gonna have some real problems from your MS. And let me just put in a plug here for statins. Because if you have a cholesterol problem, statins are really good for your MS. This is a huge twofer. Um, they're probably some of the most effective drugs for older people with progressive components to their MS. It is an active area of research right now to figure out what the best doses are. But high doses have been tested and high doses work as well or better than many of our other medicines. So sometimes I'm very comfortable with that being somebody's only treatment if they're on a lot of that. Why is that? What is their big risk? Let me tell you, if you've got out of control vascular problem and you're older, you're not gonna die from MS disability. You're gonna die from, your, from a heart attack or a stroke. But statins are very good about helping those problems. And they also help control the MS. And it may be easier to treat your MS for people who are on statins. Now, uh, you need vision care. 
I recommend you don't get your vision care at a uh, retail optometrist. You need vision care from somebody who's an experienced ophthalmologist. As you get older, people with MS get more cataracts. They get more uh, problems with uh, other kinds of eye problems that, that may be unexpected, that are inflammation in the eyes. You just need somebody who knows what they're doing. Uh, you also need somebody who knows how to fit glasses, and uh, the ophthalmologist will do that too. Um, there's a lot of people out there who will try to sell you this or that or just expensive glasses. You know, they, you may need expensive glasses, but you want somebody who's more experienced to tell you that. Urologists have really gotten involved more actively in, in dealing with bladder issues now. Um, the, the, about the only thing I'm not a huge fan of is stimulators because no matter how they make them, they're going to in, interfere in some way with you getting an appropriate MRI scan. Um, and unless your bladder is a huge problem, uh, enormous problem, I, I, I don't think that that interference is generally worth the risk. The, um, but there are lots of medications and there's Botox injections for people with really intractable urgency or leaking. The um, neurologists, um, so if you got a lot of neurological problems, if you got headaches and spasticity or pain, you may be seeing different kinds of neurological providers. You may be going to a pain clinic too. Um, in most cases, um, it's too much work for a single practice or individual. Uh, rehabilitation care is really important if you've got disabilities. Um, but the biggest rehabilitation is you do for yourself. You move. If you're sitting, you lift your legs. If you're standing, you walk. You know, if you're laying, you try to lift your legs. If you can't lift your legs, God bless you. I'm sorry you have such bad MS. You have to lift and move everything else. But all these things are there. MS Views has a lot of, a lot of content about physical exercises. Um, it's really hard to find a physical therapist who knows a lot about MS. And it, it, this is a struggle everywhere. If you have an MS center that has a physical therapy program, they're going to be really good at it and you're really lucky. And there's one here in Louisville that's very good. Um, as far as diet, if you want a simple diet to follow, look up the MIND diet. It's kind of a cross uh, between several of the good ideas, the older DASH diet for blood pressure and the Mediterranean diet. These are healthy diets. Uh, you don't need an extreme diet. Um, as far as vitamin Ds, everybody needs vitamin D for practical purposes. The question is how much you want to be, have a level more than 50 in the winter. Don't let somebody check your vitamin D in the fall. It's always going to look way better or too high uh, than it really is the rest of the year. And then there's a supplement called lipoic acid that has very good data. As far as diet, the important thing, omega-3 fatty acids, the, the, which come from certain oily fishes, tuna, salmon, herring, cod, or uh, nuts, certain nuts, uh, tree nuts mainly, if you can eat those. But you can also get, there are certain grains that have them. Um, these protect the brain. All right. I'm just about there. So if I give you some do's and don'ts, um, if you go to the doctor unprepared, you're going to squander your time that you have face to face, have all your stuff together. It's really important. Know what your medications are, know how to say them, know what they're for. A good 30, 40% of our time with patients, the mess many times is, is wasted on trying to establish this because many medicines are used for several purposes. Know who's prescribing it. Doctors have to have to get it right. Don't try to get too many things at, done at once. Um, generally, if you follow the one visit and one problem rule, you're going to do good. If there's something really urgent, you may be able to get two in. But if you go in there and every time the doctor tries to get something done, you throw out another problem, you're both going to get frustrated. Uh, do have many visits rather than many, uh, a few big visits. Uh, don't ask your doctor's office to do things you can do for yourself. When you do that, it, both of you aren't going to be happy. Uh, do get labs done. If your doctor gives you a lab order and tells you to do it and you don't do it, well, there's not nice ways to put that. It's, it's not smart. You know, um, it's going to get in the way of you getting good care. Um, if you call 
a doctor's office and you say, I just have a question, I want you to call me back. Don't expect a, a very helpful call back. If you have a question that's important, then you need, need to make an appointment. If it's not important, then it can wait for the appointment, all right? Uh, the, the, you're going to take away from time that would be given to other sick patients and you may not be happy or you may get the wrong information. Uh, somebody has to have all your information in their head to give you really good, precise answers. Don't call and ask your doctor about COVID if they're not the doctor who treats COVID, you know, all right? And don't save an important issue to the end of the visit. If there's an important issue, it should be about the visit. That's why you're there. Um, make your visit about the important things. All right. Uh, this was a friend of mine who passed away who did a lot for people with MS, and she had MS, and she served for many years on our board and as a leader in uh, science and technology. And COVID got her, and she did everything right. Sometimes you do everything right for MS, and it still gets you. And uh, all we can say is, well, we think it would have been worse if we didn't do that. But most people with MS, their life is amazingly different now than it was 30 years ago. And uh, we're very hopeful that that will even get better. I'd love to be able to say cure someday. I've got people who we've beaten MS to a draw, many, many people, and, and I hope that for you. I'm gonna stop there and let, let uh, Stuart take Thank you, Mike, very it. much. Thank you, thank you. I know that doctor went through this several years ago. I remember when you first spoke about her during a program, and fortunately, things did work out during that program. Did anybody here have a question? I've been challenged to have an attitude of gratitude, and I'm exceedingly grateful for what you've done and the MS Views and News for all the people with MS. Thank you very much. Juanita is asking, I had MS over 40 years. I continue to get worse, but I am on no treatment. Is there any hope for me? I have had MRIs and there's no active lesions, just black holes. Okay, this is a very good question. Um, so here is, here is the problem that's frequently misunderstood is that people get worse without so-called active lesions. They have relapses without active lesions. If something has changed recently, there is a reason. It's either you have an infection, which is usually obvious, or you have a relapse. But there is this unfortunate misconcept that is out there that is promulgated by doctors who don't treat a lot of MS, that if there isn't something active, on your MRI, you don't need to be treated because it's not really disease activity. And that has never been true, and it's not true now, but it happens a lot. And so someone needs to seek out care if they think they have a relapse. Now, people who are very slowly getting worse usually have progressive forms of MS. And we talk about slowly. We have people who say, uh, well, I'm just progressively getting worse. And I said, well, when did you notice it? Well, I had the flu a couple months ago and now I'm getting worse. That's a relapse, okay? If they don't know, they say, well, you know, I, I, I started walking bad, you know, I needed a cane five years ago and a walker three years ago, and now I'm pretty much using a wheelchair. That's the progressive component of the MS. It's these long pathways that are damaged and they keep getting worse. On the MRI head, you're only going to see what's going on in the brain, not in what's in the spinal cord and the other areas. And if you do a picture of the spinal cord, if somebody's getting worse, you need to do a picture of the spinal cord. The most common reason that's not MS is people have bad arthritis in their neck, what we call the stenosis or spondylosis, that's, that's damaging the spinal cord. And that needs surgery, you know, and, um, you know, neurologists and neurosurgeons know how to sort this out. You know, you shouldn't have to apologize for needing that. And MRI the head that shows a really old scars is kind of expected, and black holes are the worst of them. Uh, many times there's microscopic inflammation at the edges of them, and they slowly get worse. We call them pearls or pro progressive enhancing rim lesions. Um, the benefit of treatment is what doesn't happen. If, if your hands are at risk, you probably need treatment. 
but once you haven't got good function in your legs, treatment is not going to make your legs better uh, in, in almost all circumstances, if it's been that way for a while. And that's because those pathways are too damaged. And if one leg is damaged really badly, it can take down your whole mobility system. Um, but these are problems that are small, they're in the spinal cord, they're not seen as well on MRI. Sometimes they're seen very well by MRI and we can't fix what's broken. It's the biggest argument for, for things. Now I will say that if people have a function that if it improved just a little bit would help them, that's dalfamperdine, uh, what used to be called Ampera, is a very effective drug for some people. It's a minority, but you know, 30% of people, it's like a miracle if, if they can now do things that they didn't before. And, and even if insurance refuses to pay for it, it's, it's you know, $15 at Mark Cuban's pharmacy now. So you can, you can get it and try it with your doctor. It's a very high quality medicine that's gone from thousands of dollars a month to, 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 to just 20 bucks. So uh, it's more than that at other pharmacies. But, you know, this is something that you can do to help. Um, what do people with MS need? They need whatever is going to help them. There are some people that are later in life that are still having disease activity clinically. You won't usually see MRIs with enhancing lesions over the age of 50 or 55. Sometimes you do. It makes it very easy when you do. But they still have disease activity. It's just different. And it doesn't show up that way. And, uh, you know, we can't do anything about misconcepts that doctors have, especially hospitalist doctors, when they go to the hospital, you're, you're just lucky if, if, if you get out of there alive, because a lot of doctors are the opinion, if they, you're using a wheelchair, you must need to die, and we want you to hurry up and get out, of, get out of here, and if you die, then that's real quick and my numbers look better. But you just realize that you have to be very verbal if you wanna live and you're sick in the hospital, or if you have a sick family member with MS who had a good life and, and was doing fine until very recently, and you want them to live, you have to be extremely vocal or else uh, they will be uh, you know, recruited into a hospice care or, or, or given ineffective treatments so that they pass away. Comfort care. If you need comfort care, that's great. If you wanna go back to your life, you gotta be a very vocal advocate for the person who's sick. All right. Thank you. So that leads us into the person who wrote the book. All right, she wants to tell everybody what it's like to be a self-advocate. All right, and so she said that she had like the best neurologist. He was two hours away from where she was. He shared all the aspects of MS with her and uh, was treating not uh, just his team, but anyone else involved in care. I went through a rough, rough isolation period, lonely, depressed, and had a hard time making appointments, so I chose to go to an MS specialist in her own town, and that was when things seemed to have gotten worse. It, she went to like Helen back. Um, every time they went to run tests, they nobody you know got back to her. They went to go get her onto a new medication. Nobody was helping out. Uh, finally, she decided she had to do things for herself because she was running further and further behind. I'm telling you like a novel here. Okay, I'm sorry about that. But bottom line is, she just wanted to tell everybody that um, you know if. Um, you got to be your own advocate because if you can't help yourself, I mean, if nobody else is going to help you, um, you, you got to do it for yourself because you got to just make sure that somebody's going to do it all for you. So I just want to let you know that Colleen said that and she said a lot more, but I can't read it all. All right. Next question is from Yolanda. She wants to know what category Mavenclad is in. And also another person is asking about what are the benefits of Mavenclad? That's a good question. I left Maven Clad off the group because it's harder to put into the groups, but I should have included it. Um, Maven Clad is, is technically a kind of chemotherapy drug, but it's such a low dose that it's really an immune modulation. Uh, it is a drug that goes after the immune cells. It's, uh, if you had to pick the drug it's most like, it's most like Lemtrata, but it doesn't have 
as, as many risks or as many benefits. And so uh, it's used a lot. I, I, I use it where I would use uh, an S1P modulator or, or uh, the, the methyl fumarates. Um, it is hard to get when somebody's been stable for a long time, but they still need treatment. I think Maven Cloud is a good drug to look at. There are a lot of rules regarding it and how you need to use it. Um, the, it's kind of like getting somebody up on a tee to, to, to launch towards the moon. Uh, you've got to be sure that everything's right. Mavenclad is given as just 10 days of treatment uh, on two different years. And what it does is, the best way to look at it is it scrubs the immune system really good of the really activated cells. The company is not allowed to explain this to you. Uh, because you know, the, we know how the drug works is it poisons certain lymphocytes and it, it and once they take it up they will die and it looks like that's really good for MS and it, the drug's been researched for over 30 years for MS finally got approved in the United States even though uh, it had been approved elsewhere and had been studied long ago we don't have any comparative data we just know uh, it works for a long time. It works much longer than the government will let the company tell you. Uh, they will only let you, them tell you about two years or, or, or a little bit more. Uh, it, 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 has, it is a way to get off treatment for MS for a longer period. And uh, I really should have added that to my talk, and I will in the future, but um, it's a hard drug to explain. Uh, it has warnings about cancer on it that are uh, really quite a low risk. It has warnings about PML, which is basically probably never happened. And if it does, it's going to be really rare. And uh, you have sometimes your lymphocytes go down and they come up very slowly and you won't get it the second year. Um, but you do need a few blood counts to make sure uh, the biggest risks are, are um, a bad rash, which sometimes is bad enough that you shouldn't get it again, or shingles, which is pretty much just about the same risk as the other medicines with MS. Okay, thank you for that. Next um, person is asking, is an MR before I get to that, if there's anybody in the audience that has any questions, please raise your hand, and then I'll get up off my butt and come over and see you, okay? Otherwise, I'm here. There's a lot of questions online, and I'll go through these. All right. Um, I started to ask, uh, is MRI important after the age of 50? Well, uh, MS is different in most older people, and it depends on the context of how often you need MRIs. If your MRIs have been really stable for for uh, on prior uh, prior exams uh, uh, they can be stretched out every three or four years uh, especially if they're proven to be stable and your MS is otherwise stable um, the, if you get your MRIs done at key points in time you need a lot less of them um, the, the people oftentimes think that their MRI is going to show something and it doesn't uh, and they're often really Somebody needs to step on that phone. It's an alarm I have, and it's designed not to be silenced. Anyhow, <laughs> the, uh, so the problem is uh, if you have uh, issues with, um, with some symptom, you think an MRI scan is going to show, most of the time you'll be wrong, all right? Because most of the symptoms from MS, you don't see well on well MRI. Uh, the ones that are neurological or in the input-output system, the things with thinking and mood, they're microscopic in the brain. You can't even see them on MRI. While they may correlate in some cases with the amount of atrophy in the brain, uh, most people with MS have enough brain atrophy where that's a moot point. So you already have it. You have to deal with it. So you don't usually need, unless your MS has been active on a prior sc recent scan or you're having clinical relapses or changes, you don't need, need a head MRI every year. Now, early on in MS, when we're trying to get it controlled in the first few years, it's very important to know what's going on. That's an entirely different situation. But over 50, most people are well into MS by the time they're 50. Not always. Some people get diagnosed in their 50s. But that's, that's how it goes. Now, the spine serves two reasons. 
Um, first of all, like I said, it's not rare to get arthritic disease bad enough in the spine, a disc or arthritis, that it appears, impairs neurological function, looks just like MS. You know, what else do people need? They need a B12 level every year because it, it, the B12 deficiency looks a lot like MS when people get it. And these are common things that happen on top of uh, on top of uh, having MS that have to be watched for. Um, but you like to know how much something's changed. It helps give create the perception of how much you need. But you don't need spine scans as often as you need head scans. And if you're very well controlled, if you haven't had an MS relapse in five years, you don't need an MRI scan every year to, to tell you that the disease is well controlled. But you do need one every few years. And if, uh, you know, three or four years, I'd like to have one. You know, uh, people a lot of times are concerned about the cost. They should be concerned about the cost, but they still ought to have one. Um, other things happen as people get older. The most common thing I see happen on MRI scans of older people is all of a sudden there's a lot of little spots that look like a blood pressure problem. And they do have a blood pressure problem. It hasn't been controlled. And it gets really hard as people get older to sort out mild MS problems from blood pressure problems. And sometimes you even see they had a stroke on an MRI scan. So I don't make apologies for getting one when I think it's necessary. But um, I, would, I would say it's, it's an individual decision with, with a physician to talk about. But, um, you know, three years probably not a bad idea to have one in your 50s if you're doing fairly well. It could go a little longer because MS does get worse even when you're doing well in the MRI. We call them progressively enhancing lesions or progressively enlarging lesions. Uh, they're, they're at the very edge. They will, they will be a millimeter or two bigger, you know, because the old damage is where the new damage frequently occurs. Good question. Thank you. Next one is from a Maria. Maria writes, my neuro said I can stop my Ocrevus infusion because I'm 66 years old and it doesn't work for older people. I have PPMS. What's your opinion, please? Well, um, I know of no data that says that, that things don't work for older people that's adequate to say that you wouldn't use it in somebody who's been actively getting worse. If you're getting worse still with progressive MS, then Ocrevus is a very reasonable option. There are reasons not to use Ocrevus if people are having serious infections uh, at risk. The other medication that's uh, used for progressive MS by many physicians is, is the older drug, Copaxone, which actually probably works for progressive MS. It actually had a trial 30 years ago, 25 years ago. That, that, that pretty much uh, could have gotten it approved if it had been done a little differently. Uh, that said, um, you know, I don't know all the circumstances go into any physician's decision making, but there are plenty of people in their 60s who get ocrevus because it, it's going to slow down them getting worse. Um, the benefit of ocrevus is, is largely in people with disabilities slowing down it getting worse. You cannot perceive it. Um, and, you know, if you get really worse taking ocrevus, yeah, you should consider doing something else if it's not working. If you're stable, you know, after four or five years, yeah, I'd consider doing something else. There's a few other things. There's low-dose methotrexate was tested for progressive MS. There's other drugs that will be along. But um, there is no data which says that you shouldn't treat older people that you think need treatment. There is data that says we don't know, and there's data that says treatment may not be as effective, but people were tested on Ocrevus who were older. They were older. That is how primary progressive MS goes. And um, it, it, I mean, it, it, you can't pull out one person from a group and say, well, treatment isn't going to work for them. You don't know. You have to try and observe that person and make a decision. And if somebody can't move their arms and legs anymore and they're having serious infections, I don't know of any physician who would recommend that person gets ocrevus, you know. But if you've got a lot to lose, um, it's, it's a tough argument to make that they're not going to benefit from it. 
the um, people with relapsing forms of MS, we use Tysabri a lot in older people because I'm not worried about PML. If they're having lots of infections and they need quality of life their last few years, what's their risk of getting PML? It's a whole lot smaller than them getting an ammonia and dying because they're on, uh, on Ocrevus. You know, that's that you've got to make decisions that are individual and it's very hard to get blanket advice. Thank you. Wanda is asking if these, if your slides will be available anytime soon. And I'll let Wanda know and everybody else know that this program was being video recorded. So in about a month from now, when it gets published to our YouTube channel, you'll have access to that and you'll be able to watch this program again and have access to all the slides. Okay. Next question. I've had MS over 20 years. I'm seeing a general neurologist who has had me only on one MS medication this entire time. And although I feel I am getting worse, he doesn't think so. What do you suggest? Well, there, I've done some lectures for MS Views that are online about measuring yourself with MS. And this is a strong argument for why that's a good idea. You know, walking 25 feet, seeing how far you can walk, keeping track of this over time. These are things that a neurologist can't appreciate without doing um, some of the cognitive testing that's out there. Um, if someone says they're getting worse, it depends on what they mean. If it's their bladder, uh, well, neurologists can't measure that very effectively, and that certainly may be an issue, but that's a management issue. Uh, if it's their fatigue, it's, it's a completely different matter and that needs to be treated as a symptom if it's their mobility that's a neurological issue and you got to bring that up if it's spasticity interfering if your legs are stiff and you can't move there are lots of things to do for that you talk to the physician about it uh, it's probably a management issue if you're on the same medicine for a long time it depends on what the medicine is um, you know, some people change medications and they go downhill like a rocket because it was actually working pretty well. Uh, you never know until you try that. So you, if you're going to change to a medicine, you have to change to a medicine that's more effective in general. And even that kind of rule doesn't always work. You know? So uh, doctor's advice is cheap. But, you know, if you've got a medicine you tolerate well, if you're happy with it, there's no issue. If you're not happy with how you're doing, um, there are other medicines. It, it, it's, it's possible to try. But there's a lot of patients with MS that still have relapses, and they go to the doctor when they're not in a relapse, and they experience problems other time that they do. And if you don't have an exam, it's really hard to tell if you have a relapse if you're older. They're often less traumatic. So, so she continues, yeah. when you got to the neurological aspect, she continues that that she was once walking fine and now using a mobility device to get around and her doctor still says she's normal. Well, she's normal for somebody with secondary progressive MS, but that's not satisfactory. So um, the, the drugs I talked about earlier, like dalfampradine, helps uh, people with their mobility. Um, people whose balance is bad and has gotten there and they're barely ambulatory need to focus on keeping on their feet. Uh, rehabilitation is very helpful for getting some ideas, but the most helpful thing is you lift your legs, you move to your legs, you don't sit. If you do that, your legs are going to get weaker. Now, your control of your legs is very important, and if 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 the problem is spasticity, there's a lot to do for spasticity. If the problem is weakness, dalfampradine often helps weakness. Certainly exercise helps weakness. As far as other treatments for your MS, the most commonly used medicine for older people with secondary progressive MS is, is uh, Ocrevus. The benefit you would see is what doesn't happen. It would just go slower. And uh, the risks and the, the, the expense may be significant that you have. But there's no harm to trying any other medicine. We just don't have as much med information. Mazent actually has data on this. Mazent is not a simple drug to use for many neurologists, but they have data that their drug keeps people on their feet. And it's an S1P. And the other S1Ps probably have similar benefits. But Mazent has the data. And uh, that would be a drug I'd strongly look at um, because of its benefits in this situation. But it is not an easy drug to use. It is not as supported as well as we would like. Thank you. Next, 
Does Ampira work for anything with MS other than walking? Ampira works for lots of things. It was the government that wouldn't let anybody tell tell that. Um, it was originally Ampira was originally tested because it made people see better, and it also does make people stronger. It it's in the physical therapy uh, and occupational therapy programs have tested it and said it makes people's hands work better. Uh, Ampira is kind of uh, it, like spinning the bottle. You never know what it's going to do. Uh, it's called dalfamperidine. It's this drug I had up here called dalfamperidine. Uh, it used to be called foraminopyridine, which the government made them change because foraminopyridine, if you buy it in the hardware store, it's bird poison. Um, the uh, And you don't want to get it in the hardware store. But it, the, the dalfamperidine ER is an excellent medicine. It's very well controlled uh, release. And what it does is makes the nervous system work better by making it more excitable. The... Um, it can improve a lot of things. Some people, it improves their fatigue. Some people, it improves their mind. Some people, it improves their tremor. But it can also cause nerve pain. It can also make people feel uh, giddy or lightheaded or numb. So, so everybody's different. It's a cheap medicine to try. The only people who can't take it are people who've had epileptic seizures in the past. And they should never take it because it increases the risk. Okay, thank you. What can you tell us about, uh, uh, Patty is asking, what can you tell us about LDN? Uh, LDN uh, is, is a term that's used to refer to low-dose naltrexone. So low-dose naltrexone is a treatment concept that was developed long ago for a number of different uh, diseases. Naltrexone is a drug we understand very well. It's a drug that's approved in large doses for treatment of uh, opiate and alcohol dependence. And it decreases relapses in that by blocking the effects of, uh, of morphine-like receptors. Uh, it's like the drug that you hear about saving people's lives who, when they get fentanyl which, uh, you know, it's called naloxone. It's an injectable drug. Now, Trexone is an oral drug. It's actually approved and on the market also in low dose as part of a combination medicine with bupropion, which is an depressant to treat weight loss, uh, to cause weight loss by decreasing appetite. So it's part of an appetite suppressant. Low dose naltrexone can be uh, can be made by a pharmacy in the, in oddball doses, but you could uh, a lot of doctors will give people the standard 50 milligram pill and say divide it into quarters and take one a day. That gets to about the same dose. I'm not telling you to do that. The data is very thin. It does help certain kinds of pain syndromes. Um, it acts, it's been tested in MS and people feel better. I don't think it fixes MS. I don't think it has good effects on protecting the nervous system. I think it's more like an antidepressant the way it's used. And uh, I, I'm not a big fan of it, but once in a while I have people try it because I'm kind of at wit's end about how to deal with their fatigue. And uh, they haven't tried it, and it's a simple, safe thing, and it has appetite-suppressing effects as well. It decreases binge eating, basically, is, is one of the effects it has. But, but it's not available in a dose size that's low, except when it's in this drug, and I blocked the, on the name, but there's a drug out there with low-dose naltrexone in it, uh, and, and bupropion that's approved for weight loss. So it's really not a miracle for for. MS, but some people find it helpful, and it, it does, it, it has been shown to make some people feel better. Next, a gentleman writes, is there anything that could be done for the down there's for those men with sexual frustration from not being able to feel what's needed to be felt due to their MS? Yeah, the, the, so when you're talking about sexual function, it's really complicated. And the, the most refractory problem that's a trouble is numbness and with MS. And uh, it, whether you're a man or a woman, if you don't have proper sensation in your groin, uh, it's very frustrating because you lack a lot of the normal responses to sexual stimulation that you should have. Uh, that said, some people have areas that are more become more sensitive over time. 
Um, long ago, a doctor in uh, Indianapolis found that the thing that worked best was a dose of steroids <laughs> for people's sexual dysfunction. Uh, you can only give people so many big doses of steroids. Um, the dalfamperdine uh, sometimes increases sensation. A lot of the MS treatments have side effects of increasing pain that some of us think is because sensation's better. You know, there is no simple way. <clears throat> we usually counsel people who have trouble with with resp with inadequate responses to stimulation to use other kinds of stimulation to use vibrators to try <coughs> other areas that are sensitive uh, instead and uh, but there is no magical way to repair the problem uh, and this is the biggest argument that you need to be on early treatment for MS and get it treated um, the, uh, y y whereas erectile dysfunction, there are 16 different ways to, Im to get an erection, get fixing the sensation is not there. Um, trouble getting the climaxes. There's not a lot of other, uh, medications that do that. Uh, the, the, there's an old African, uh, herbal remedy called Yohimbi that does help some people with, with the, uh, climax issue, uh, that you can try. Um, the, uh, the, the, the medical version of that drug is very expensive and not practical, but the, uh, over the counter, uh, supplement version is out there and can be tried. There isn't a good, uh, solution there are for women. There are drugs that ha help the desire that are very expensive, specialty drugs that are actually related to some of the drugs we use to treat relapses. Um, they're very specialized. It's hard to go into them on this. But. What was the name that you said for the men with? Well, you can try Yohimbi. What is that? Spell it, it. It's, 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 it's tree bark. Spell it. Spell it. <laughs> Y-O-H-I-M-B-E. Okay. And uh, it's a supplement. It's not standardized. You never know what you're getting in a bottle, you know, that you buy from some supplement store. Um, but some people say it helps, helps uh, climaxes. Um, uh, it can cause some nausea or some headache, but it usually does The joke of that is you get wood. <laughs> That's, and there is no, there is no shortage of people who want to sell you something for that. But, but it's now gotten to the point where Viagra like medicines are, are so cheap that you can get those and, and the drug called Tadalafil, which used to be sold as Cialis actually works both for helping you empty your bladder and for erections for men. You know, so, but the, the, uh, it's, it's, a the poor sensitivity, the poor sensation is, is a big problem. And people usually deal with it with vibration stimulation, have a frank discussion with your partner. Okay. Thank you. There's a person online from Europe and she's been online with several of our programs lately. She's got a new question and she wants to know what oral drugs do you recommend that might be available in Europe? Um, well, most things are available in Europe. Teraflutamide is a generic drug in Europe, I think, and uh, or it's nearly so. Um, uh, the, the, the methyl fumarates have been, I mean, dimethyl fumarates have been available for a long time in Europe. Fingolimod was a very popular drug in Europe, which is Jelenia. Uh, in fact, it was almost a standard drug for a long time. It's hard to start. The safety plan in the United States is more complicated than that in Europe, I think, but um, it is, um, you know, all these are very effective drugs. And uh, they're, I'm trying to think, uh, Mavenclad is uh, available in Europe too. So if somebody has got access to that, Mavenclad is a great drug. In the United States, it's listed, you've got to use it as a second line drug. And there are all these recommendations. I don't think that they have those in Europe, and Mavenclad's more accessible there. And it's, you know, it, to take a course of medicine for, for 20 days and not have an MS relapse for, for six or seven years, which is the usual response to Mavenclad, is a pretty good thing if you have relapsing MS. If you have really treatment refractory MS, uh, there are no promises for anything because if you've relapsed on several different treatments, you're probably going to relapse on everything. It's a question of how often. Okay, thank you. Next, uh, Jane writes, similarly to what happened with Juanita earlier with 
uh, not being on an MS medication. For 43 years now, slow progression, using a roller walker all the time. Neurologist said she couldn't give me any medication that would do more good than harm. And so therefore, she's never been on any medication. Yeah, well, uh, it's a question of what you got to lose. If you're still having, if you're in this very insidious secondary progressive uh, form, which mainly refers to the, your mobility and your leg function, the question is what's going on with your arms? What's going on with your swallowing? Are these at risk? There are people who haven't had a relapse in 20 years. Are they at risk? Uh, yeah. Yeah. The, do you want to try something to reduce that risk? Well, it depends. If somebody's, you know, 80 years old and they haven't had a relapse in 20 years and they're not walking well for a lot of reasons, I'm not inclined to treat that person. If somebody's 60, uh, they got a lot of road ahead of them. And it's unfortunate that their legs are in that state. But I look at their hands and their swallowing and their vision as targets that are important. Because let me tell you, people still have relapses. They have bad relapses, and then they don't recover from them. And so it's just like having a stroke sometimes when you have an MS relapse. You're never the same. Um, there are lots of safe medicines. Interferon beta, very safe. Glutarimer acetate, very safe. Abagio, very safe, very easy to protect you against relapses. Is it gonna slow down the progression of legs? Not once it's been there for a while, you're gonna eventually lose a leg, leg function. It's, it's just, it, when those, those pathways are seriously damaged, they are just going to get worse. Um, and that's why it's very important to treat your MS early and prevent those complications. But you know, if you've been in that situation where you've never been on treatment and got away with it, that's that's great, but this is what normally happens with MS. And but you can always change what's going to happen with the other limbs that that are at risk. Great, thank you. So our next question is about cannabis. How likely is it to become nationally approved? Well, this is a very good and this is a very good question. And let me just presage by saying that we talk about cannabis because it's a topic that people want to talk about. Uh, this is not in this is not an entirely safe uh, safe way to treat anything in MS, uh, but it is approved in forms that are derived from cannabis. These drugs we call cannabinoids are approved in parts of the world for treating MS spasticity and pain. The cannabis, it, it, most of the reason that people use cannabis is because of the intoxicating effects of a chemical called Delta-9 THC, or THC for short. There is a Delta-8 THC that is made, that can be made from hemp, good old Kentucky hemp in this area, and it is legal to sell in Kentucky and Tennessee, this is almost identical to the drug that is intoxicating in marijuana. And it is sold in very aggressive doses that anybody can walk into many of the stores and buy. This is basically the same drug. And it is a little bit different in the milligrams. The, the federal government has issued an advisory telling people this is not a safe drug. And they are correct. Do people use it? Yes, people use it. You have to be very careful with it. People with MS can go nuts taking this stuff, and they do. And we get calls from emergency departments several times a year because somebody overdid it with either using regular cannabis, which smoked, and it's a very big dose, or taking a large dose of one of these compounds. Even medicinal doses, that are approved that we give sometimes for people with wasting or refractory nausea, this, the, these drugs, people can go nuts, okay? They, they get out of their head. It's been tested for MS. This drug has been tested. It was tested in Great Britain. They use 20 milligrams a day, which is a stout dose, which is the way to do if you wanna see if something works. And it, it was iffy. It didn't, it didn't have a big effect, but it may have had a little effect. But the most impressive effect, 20% of the people went nuts 
Okay. You need to understand that this is not a drug that is, that is as safe as the circumstances that you obtain it in. Now in many states, uh, they are legal forms of THC that are available. They are often sold in small doses, which are, which are relatively safe. The drug that's approved for MS outside the United States is actually an oral spray, which is very powerful because when it gets in there, it's like a much bigger dose. And it started at very tiny doses. It's a one-to-one -one mix of THC and CBD. CBD is another cannabis-derived compound, which is completely different than THC, is very safe, can be used in huge quantities, can interact with some of your medicines. But other than that, you can, go, you can take huge amounts of CBD without, without any great risk to your mind or, or, or your abilities. So these are, nobody can be sure what they're getting when they go into a vape store or something and buy something that says THC and stay away from that drug called Kratom. That's just morphine by another name. And, uh, you know, there, there, there are things that go, fall through loopholes in the law that are still have risk. And you need to be aware of this. And not only that, just imagine if a kid gets hold of one of these gummies, it's enough to make a, an adult loopy. It's, it's a really bad situation. So be, be very careful if you choose to use those kind of compounds because I can't, as a physician, give you really great advice other than that. Be very careful. And people say, well, how much should I take? It says, don't take very much. Take an eighth of it and just make sure it doesn't because it, it, this is an intoxicating drug. It happens to be legal over the counter and you have to be careful. And, and that goes doubly for anything that's legal cannabis or uh, legal uh, edible uh, cannabis derived substances like THC. Thank you. A person named Patty writes, I'm fortunate to have no pain with my MS. Can, ha can, can cannabis still help for my MS? Mm -hmm. Well, this is, this is a good question, and, and there's not been a lot of research. People who take cannabis often say it makes pain better, but when they test people, and there was a recent, very carefully done study, it suggested that the pain really isn't any different. How they react to pain is differently, which is not surprising given what it is. Uh, Tylenol, believe it or not, acetaminophen, is becomes a little bit of a cannabinoid in your body. And it is believed that is how it actually relieves pain. And it also alters behavior, we've learned. It makes people apathetic. And apathetic is the same sort of thing you see with the people who use a lot of cannabis because they don't get a lot done. But uh, with Tylenol, the problem is that if you take enough Tylenol to intoxicate yourself, you're dead. So because the chemical is not safe for the liver. But that is part of how these drugs work and it is they change your behavior. They are very fundamental chemicals in the brain called uh, anandamide that regulate your mood and your appetite. And we've had drugs that interfere with those. And if you block them, people go bananas. They, they become anxious, you know, upset, depressed people. And if you give them too much, they become lethargic and lack any kind of initiative. I mean, you know, you know the people who overdo it with cannabis are like, that's what they're like, you know. And and so you have to make choices. This is a free country. You have to be very careful with these drugs. In general, smoked cannabis is so much more drug than you really need to deal with the situation. Um, I, I advise against it. It's also worse for you than tobacco and really bad for your lungs. Since you need your lungs, you shouldn't do that to them. But these, the, you can make a case for trying these, these edible drugs and you can use as much CBD as you possibly want to try. CBD does work for some people for pain and anxiety and other things and it's very safe. THC, not so safe, does work for some people. A lot of pain clinics will even try it. Um, you know, over-the-counter cannabis where you can get it and states where you can get it. Um, well, you have to be careful. You have to be really careful because you wind up in an ER out of your head, you know, if you're not careful. And, and the people who tell you, oh, no, that never happens, it happens all the time. <laughs> it happens all the time. 
and and uh, their and and people who use a lot, their mind is severely affected. Over time, if they're off it, it slowly improves, but it's it's a huge problem. You're not going to be a very productive person taking a lot of THC, but if you choose to do that, that's your right, and uh, just don't keep your cannabis with a gun because that makes you a drug dealer. Two questions. First one, I want I would like to know if there's any holistic way to treat multiple sclerosis, asked by David. Everybody should treat their multiple sclerosis holistically and with effective medication because holistic medications aren't going to change much about what happens to you in the future. And, uh, you know, it's dumb luck is just about as good as holistic treatment. How you feel is very important. Doing things that help you feel better and your mood are very important. Exercise, very good for your brain amazing for your brain uh, fish from the ocean tuna herring salmon cod oily fishes really good for your brain protect your brain okay and and then the other things that help i mean some supplements do help vitamin d is very important you know getting your vitamin d level good because most people they mess have very poor vitamin d's half of them are under 20 uh, which is inadequate and uh, th that makes more difference in the first few years than a lot of other things we do. But the omega-3s make a huge difference. Not Choosing not to treat active MS with effective medicine, and, and, and we have now what are really cheap, safe, effective medicines, as well as what's that are covered well, is a mistake that you'll regret the rest of your life when you have disabilities that cannot be improved and slowly get worse. Okay, next, what can you tell us about stem cell therapy and when do you think it will be approved in the United States? Well, you can already get stem cell therapy of different types. Now, first of all, I wanna make a big distinction than the people who advertise to you that they do stem cell treatments and what we talk about in a scientific framework as stem cell therapy for MS. The people who are advertising to you stem cell treatments would be nicely referred to in terms that basically mean quack. They want your money. They're gonna give you something that's not proven. In fact, it's been proven not to work. So don't do it. Don't waste your money. They wanna get you in a room and have you write a big check and people who aren't doctors are going to inject you with things that you don't know what they are and they probably don't do anything good. And it costs you a lot of money. That's not good for you. What we mean by autologous hemopoietic stem cell transplantation is where you go into a hospital because you have very active MS, raging MS, not just you have disability from MS. Your MS isn't disabling you so bad yet. And what they do is they give you a dose of chemotherapy, which should kill you, okay? And it kills your bone marrow and immune system. And then they give you back some of your cells that they collected beforehand that are called the stem cells from the bone marrow that rebuild the immune system from zero, all right? You're in the hospital for weeks. Everybody gets life-threatening infections where they nearly die, and some of them do, all right? And when they get better, their brain is really beat up from the chemotherapy, their hair is gone, for a long time and it's never the same again. And then their immune system, they get, they get retrained by giving it all the vaccines you ever got again. And it's never good as it was before, but the MS will stop. And the people who do this abroad in Mexico, in Eastern Europe, lower the doses. It's not as effective. It's certainly safer. And then they charge you a lot of money and you do this and it doesn't work very well for a lot of people. And uh, people don't want to hear this message. Doctors have seen this. There's very few reasons to get this kind of treatment for MS because we have such effective other medicines. In some countries, they have experienced doctors who make these decisions. In Canada, there are a few people who do it. In, um, in Northern Europe, there are a few people who do it. They've looked and compared these drugs. There's a large research trial that's running in the United States to compare the treatment of these agents. Will it work well? Yeah, it works well. But if you kill off one in 20 people doing a good treatment that you didn't have to, what's the point? 
the point is, it's not worth it. We've got good medicines that work. The medicines we have that are talked about today, the heavy lifters, control MS quite well. They're not going to remove all problems. Uh, if you go abroad to one of these company, uh, to one of these countries where there's a doctor so and so who does a lot of this, I guarantee you they don't do it the way it's been proven scientifically to work. There are a couple places that do, but they're not the ones that are out there saying, "Come to our location and do this." It's a it's a big mistake to to consider that. Now, can it help you? You might get lucky. You know, you might get lucky. It may do the trip, but we see people all the time who've had that treatment and the disease comes back because it wasn't done in the way that's been researched. Okay. Okay, we're finished. Thank you, doctor, for doing this. All right, so uh, enjoy. Have a good one. Thanks for everybody for everything. Bye-bye.